This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hello, this is Greg LeBlanc. Welcome to Unsiloed. And today I'm here with uh, Richard Rangham, who is a professor of uh, biological anthropology at, at Harvard. And the, the author, is that correct? Yes, I'm, I'm actually a research professor, which means that's a, a nice way of saying I'm retired. Oh, okay. Well, you're doing a lot of with your retirement because uh, I have to say that this book right here, which just recently came out, The, the Goodness Paradox, is is really a, a, a masterpiece. It's a tour de force, an amazing uh, book. Uh, I enjoyed it. I couldn't I couldn't really put it down. Um, and that's true also of your previous books that I couldn't put down when I bought them and read them soon after publication, uh, including this one called Catching Fire and this, this first one uh, called uh, de- demonic males. Um, and so, uh, although they're very different in terms of their topics and, uh, subject matter, uh, I think all three of them are just uh, incredibly impactful and influential and interesting and thought provoking. And so I'm really excited that we can hopefully talk about all three of these books. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. And I want to point out that there is a common theme in my own mind among these books, and that is what studying chimpanzees does to stimulate thoughts about human evolution. Yes, and I think uh, the question of, you know, who we are, what, what are humans, you know, what is human nature, this is something which, you know, everyone, every thinking human being has been more or less discussing and thinking about since the pre-Socratics, right? You know, what is it that makes us human? Uh, what is it that makes us different from the, the other animals, the other species? And of course, they didn't have the language of, of evolution, but to this day, uh, you know, we still think about what is nature and, and what is culture and looking at our kind of kindred folks, both chimps and, and bonobos, as you do uh, in this book, uh, helps to really understand who we are. Um, can you tell us just a little bit? Maybe, I was thinking of starting with your last book, but um, maybe we can talk about the first book and talk about kind of what drew you to study uh, chimps and, and bonobos. Well, I've always been interested in nature, uh, just enjoying nature. And um, in the course of doing that, I found myself uh, uh, in my pre-college uh, year, uh, I had the opportunity to spend nine months in a national park in Zambia, where I was fully exposed to uh, wildlife in its kind of rawest sense. Um, it was an area slightly larger than Switzerland that had something like 15 people living in it. And uh, for the rest, it was uh, miles and miles of African bush. And I was given the job of studying a waterbuck, uh, an, an antelope called waterbuck, um, and the way that the males and females organize themselves and the basic mating system. And that showed me the power of behavioral ecology as it was you know, becoming known to be uh, in understanding uh, an animal society. And then, of course, the obvious question was, well, uh, how does this kind of approach apply to humans? And so the opportunity to, to go and study chimps was just fantastic uh, because uh, it's hard to imagine any species that is more relevant to thinking about our own. I mean, actually, at the time I did this, so what I'm talking about is um, 67, I was in Zambia, and then went to college, uh, studied zoology at Oxford for three years. And um, so uh, in the early 70s, when I started studying chimps, the kind of dominant model for thinking about the evolution of human society was to think about carnivores, because everyone was so impressed by the fact that humans seem to eat a lot of meat. And the big challenges, the intellectual challenges, the social challenges seem to be associated with how do you get meat? So George Schaller had a splendid paper looking at lions and thinking about the implications for human social evolution. Um, and uh, people had not really zeroed in on chimps in quite the same way from a point of view of behavioral ecology. And that was partly because by the time the 70s are old around, we were only just beginning to get a sense of, of what chimps were like. You know, Jane Goodall started in 1960, uh, and she was the one who broke open the story about chimpanzee society. But even 10 years later, when I arrived, it was not really quite clear how society was organized 
beyond just the family, the family of uh, a female with her dependent young. Because Jane had seen, um, seen all the chimps that she saw uh, were all part of one continuous social network. And she wondered if that social network just went on forever. There was no social boundaries. And it was in the uh, very early 70s, when I was lucky enough to be uh, studying chimpanzees uh, with Jane Goodall, that uh, the discovery of the social boundaries emerged with all sorts of subsequent questions. So well, as an historian, when you read accounts of the past, oftentimes those accounts tell you more about the uh, the perspective of the time of the author than they do about the uh, the time that's being studied. Um, a little bit, maybe the same is true to some extent with our study of animals. Um, you know, how we think about chimpanzees, how we think about our closest relatives tells us a little bit about how we, we think about ourselves. Um, in political philosophy, we've, we've got the, the Hobbesian perspective and we've got the Rousseauian perspective and, and everyone's trying to figure out like wh which, which is a better, more accurate description of, of us as, as human beings in our nature. And, and, and in, in this book, um, you know, you discuss both uh, chimps and bonobos and, and maybe they each line up with those different perspectives. And I have to confess that when I, when I read this book, this, this really kind of strengthened my, my view of, of the Hobbesian uh, perspective um, based on the chapters on, on chimps. Um, to what extent do, are, you, are you thinking about the, the implications uh, that, that most people uh, care about uh, about human behavior and human nature when you're studying chimps and bonobos and other species? Well, of course, it's very hard to avoid it. It's, a very, it's very hard to avoid um, trying to work out what it means when we see either similarities or differences. And the, the big similarity that hit my generation of chimpanzee researchers uh, like a thunderbolt uh, began uh, in January of 1974, when for the first time, a small party of chimpanzees um, went to the edge of their territory and then stalked into the neighboring territory and found a male in the neighboring territory and crept up to within just a few yards of him without him seeing them and then leapt on him and beat him to death, basically. So this was the death of Hodi. Uh, Hodi was a male in the neighboring group who the researchers knew well. And um, the, actually the chimpanzees that did the attacking knew well because the group that Hodi belonged to had broken off as a separate subgroup and become its own group. So they'd, they'd fissioned uh, into two different groups, so different, so distinct, that now we had a party of males making a deliberate raid into the neighboring group's territory in order to find a male and kill him. And what that did was to seal the notion that had been clearly emerging over the previous three or four years of uh, the social communities having extremely distinct social boundaries. And what the reason that this was so extraordinary from the point of view of thinking about human evolution and, and human society was that we had all grown up at that time uh, with what Conrad Lorenz, the great German ethologist, uh, had declared to be true. Uh, he had said that animals are unlike humans because they don't kill each other. They have special techniques for avoiding intense violence and aggression, special submissive signals that inhibit aggression by the dominant individual and so on. And now here we were seeing something totally different. And not only that, but it was in one of the two species that is most closely related to humans. So the discoveries of the 1960s and 70s were that Chimpanzees, one of humans' two closest relatives, lived in social groups in which relationships among males were really critical in the sense of dominating ordinary social life because the males were bullies. 
they got their way, they they would would threaten females who, as it were, disagreed with them, who challenged their, them for food or didn't want to be mated or uh, got in the way. And then we find out not only that, that uh, these males do human-like things of hunting and sharing meat, as Jane Goodall had discovered, but now they go off on war raids and attack members of neighboring groups. The response of a lot of people to that discovery was, be very, very careful. Don't go and leap into any conclusion about this being something that tells us directly about human evolution. And I think that was right. I think it's right to be cautious. But as time has gone on, I think all the evidence points to this being not only a very regular behavior of chimpanzees. We now know it occurs uh, across the continent in different chimpanzee communities. The uh, tendency to, to take opportunities to kill members of neighboring groups. But I think the evidence is also very clear that um, the pattern of violence that we see in chimps follows the kinds of rules that you would expect if you're thinking about a human-like pattern. And the similarities that we see between chimps and humans are that uh, in both cases, they're living in uh, relatively small groups uh, where uh, if they meet members of neighboring communities, it's dangerous because those members of the neighboring communities might attack you. And what do we find in both species when we're thinking about hunters and gatherers who are the obvious model for thinking about the Pleistocene? We find that uh, small groups will take advantage of opportunities to kill members of neighboring groups. Now you have to say in humans, you have to qualify that by saying that we're talking here about groups that are different in language. So some of your neighbors, maybe you know, to the west as it were, or in one direction, might be members of your, your own tribe, your own linguistic uh, unit. And those relationships with the neighboring groups that speak the same language or dialect might be friendly or they might be occasionally hostile, but if they're hostile, then there are systems of peacemaking to bring you together. So they tend to be less serious. But the ones that are always serious, a state of, um, of, of war that is very difficult to overcome, are the ones with groups that speak a different language. And there, the similarities between uh, chimps and uh, what humans do is haunting. And, and I'm, I'm now certainly on the side of the people who, who think that this bespeaks a, a common inheritance that goes back to when we broke up with the chimps of six, seven million years ago. I think some people believe that uh, language was something that was necessary for the kind of communal activity that involves war, right? How is it that chimpanzees can engage in collective uh, violence uh, intra-group violence without the ability to coordinate through language. Yeah, I mean, what you see is very little communication as these raiding parties form. Sometimes you might find that um, one particularly eager male who would be one of the highest ranking males, maybe the highest ranking, the alpha male, um, might uh, display socially at uh, one or two of his his colleagues, as it were, uh, just charging towards them at, at high speed, and um, but not hitting them or anything like that, uh, charging towards them and just veering off uh, and then getting him to, them to follow him. But that's about the size of it. You do not see any kind of, of articulate signaling where you know, they're trying to say, let's go on a raiding party and let's go off you know, to the east or, and here's how we'll do it. But there's absolutely no indication of that. Uh, and the implication is that uh, they have a psychology where if they are reasonably well fed and as it were have got time on their hands, then uh, they uh, enjoy the prospect of going off and looking for opportunities to kill the neighbors or to attack the neighbors. They are very judicious about the way they do it though. And uh, basically what they will always do is choose to attack when they have overwhelming power. So they will only attack when they have 
uh, a goodly number against basically one lone individual who they hope to find just foraging on his own, you know, maybe in the border area where uh, chimps don't tend to forage and so the, the pickings tend to be good. They don't tend to forage there because it's dangerous, but sometimes they're driven to, to go there by hunger. And uh, the average uh, number in a attacking group is eight compared to one. So that is obviously overwhelming. And it means that the attack is very easily performed because basically one individual holds one foot, another holds another foot, uh, another couple hold the arms, and uh, then the attackers can do what they want. And they do, you know, tear a thorax out, to rip his balls off and uh, bite in and twist his arms. And, you know, it's, it's horrendous. And none of the attackers get hurt at all even though you've got an incredibly strong animal fighting for his life. So it's very, very well designed. And the implication of all this is that what the chimps do is treat all outside members, all non-group members, as worthy of death. Um, I shouldn't say all, I should say uh, all adults. And I... Uh, what I'm really trying to say is all adult males. It, they have been kills of females, but they're very, very rare. And basically what they do with females is um, beat them up, maybe attack the infants of the females. But the implication is they want to keep the females alive and, and hope they'll come into their, their own community, join the attacking males. So they treat any adult male in neighboring groups as an enemy, and they don't need to communicate about that. They don't need to say, shall we go after this one or not? It's just understood. And I think it's, you know, it's like sex. You don't um, have any kind of reproductive rationale on the whole when you have sex. And certainly, you know, the average chimpanzee does not, and probably the average human doesn't. But natural selection is placed in our brains a tendency to look forward to having sex and enjoying it because that's the way evolution does best if in this case males really enjoy sex and the same with really enjoying the opportunity to kill a member of a neighboring group of course you know we think this is very surprising because it's scary to get involved in an attack because we might get hurt but that's where this overwhelming power feature is so dramatic, is so important, because the chimps don't get hurt. So they have fun uh, attacking someone that uh, is meaningless to them, except that it is meaningful to get rid of one of the neighbors. Because if you can get rid of the neighbors, pick them off one at a time, then what happens is, what has been seen in the wild, uh, you can expand your territory, get access to more food, your females start having more food to eat. They have babies at a faster rate. Their babies survive better. All of these things have been seen. There's a horrendous logic to it. So there's an evolutionary logic for the, the group engaging in this type of behavior. What, what's the evolutionary logic for an individual participating in, in one of these raids? Uh, wouldn't it make sense for an individual member of the chimpanzee group to free ride off the, the benefits of territorial aggression? Well, it certainly would, and and this is remains you know somewhat of a puzzle for people. Uh, why is it that uh, each male doesn't kick back and say, "Hey, guys, you go off and do all the hard work, and I'll stay here and uh, make out with the females"? Um, the uh, the fact that the the uh, attacks are cheap because there's very little risk of getting hurt uh, is obviously a contributor here, but. Uh, they're still, you know, you would think that they could save some energy and just, just not go. The ones who tend to go um, with the highest motivation in the sense that uh, they're least likely to drop out as they approach the border are the higher ranking males. And the alpha male is the one who is most likely to be involved. And the theoretical rationale is that the highest ranking ones are the ones who have the most to gain by um, a behavior that ultimately benefits the young in the group and the, the future reproduction uh, because they're, gonna, they're the ones who have most babies. 
So they've got the ones, uh, they have enough at stake to justify making sure that this really works. So I think that the similarities that we see between the violent tendencies of humans and the violent tendencies of chimpanzees, this, this is a bit discouraging for uh, people who are looking for kind of human goodness and kindness uh, as, a, as a byproduct of evolution. And, and so more and more people I think are at least outside of biology, maybe also in, inside of biology are paying more attention to, to bonobos. Could, could you tell us about um, how was this species discovered in the first place? Uh, wasn't it believed to be simply a, uh, a group of juveniles when they first encountered the, the skulls of the, of the early specimens? Well, Yes, I mean, it's kind of a lovely story. The bonobos were, in a sense, discovered in, in a museum um, by uh, Harold Coolidge, an American um, primatologist, who was looking in the uh, Royal Museum uh, of Belgium uh, in Tervuren and was looking at uh, a, a, skull of a, chimpan of a yeah, skull of a chimpanzee, as he thought it was, as it were. Uh, and uh, he could see that um, it looked like a juvenile. And then, to his astonishment, he saw that the bones were fused in the skull, meaning that it was an adult. The, the, uh, the ape had stopped growing. So this was an ape with, which, as an adult, had a skull that looked like the skull of a juvenile chimpanzee. And uh, he then checked and found out that this was true of all the specimens that came from uh, the supposed chimpanzees that lived on the left bank, on the south side of the Congo River in Central Africa. So he uh, then uh, described this as a different species from chimpanzees, uh, a chimpanzee that had a juvenilized head. That was the discovery of bonobos. At that point, nobody knew anything about their behavior, and it took a long time because the Congo was a difficult place to work, and the forests in which bonobos live are pretty remote. But a, a Japanese primatologist called Takayoshi Kano uh, struggled through in uh, the 1970s and established a field site where uh, the sort of the basics of bonobo life were discovered. And these were emerging in the uh, really the uh, late 70s, uh, but much more in the early 80s. So you know, 10 to 15 years after we stood, studied chimpanzees. And lo and behold, here we have the other species um, of chimpanzee, uh, chimpanzees and bonobos, equally closely related to humans. And it turns out, after we discovered that chimpanzees have this extraordinary propensity uh, for lethal violence, the bonobos were kind of the opposite. They were one of the most peaceful of any m mammal that had been described. And the sort of uh, interesting curiosity that people enjoyed associated with that fact of greatly reduced violence was that within their groups, the way that they avoided a lot of uh, ordinary sort of day-to-day -day aggression was by making up or reducing tension using sex. So it turned out that uh, both uh, males with females, but also females with females and sometimes males with males, uh, would rub their genitals together at a time when there was some kind of social tension. And this clearly was helping uh, reduce the propensity for, for violence. As time went on, it became increasingly clear that there was a difference between chimps and bonobos in their intergroup relationships. And uh, a group of uh, about 20 primatologists who studied chimpanzees and bonobos combined all their data in 2014 and showed at that time that uh, there was a systematic tendency for intergroup violence, including kills, to occur in chimpanzees uh, in a way that was quite distinct from anything that had been seen in bonobos. By that time, it was possible to cite four studies of bonobos, and in none of them had there been uh, not only no kills in intergroup contexts, but in a sense, more importantly, 
no attempts at kills. You know, nothing like what you saw with chimpanzees of sneaking into the neighbouring ranges, even if they actually turn around and run away once they discover that their, their enemy is in a big group. You just didn't see that kind of hostile behaviour. You saw some hostile behaviour. Uh, though it was possible for large groups of bonobos to come together and have some sort of aggressive encounter. Mm, haven't really been seen in good detail, but bonobos can come back from it with scratched faces and um, you know, clearly some fighting's been going on. But even more dramatic, it turned out that bonobos quite often have peaceful relationships, peaceful interactions with bonobos in a neighboring group. And so this is unbelievable to people studying chimpanzees because you get nothing like that at all. You know, two chimpanzee males from different groups cannot come together except in a state of, of intense hostility. But with these bonobos, a largish group, 20, 30 individuals, might meet another largish group and travel with them for two or three days and sit and relax with them. And that relaxing includes males from one group having sex with females from the other group while the males from the other group watch. That's how unaggressive they were. So now we have these two species equally closely related to humans showing extraordinary differences in their degree of hostility. And obviously you have the kind of uh, dynamic that you were referring to of um, primatologists sort of lining themselves up to say, well, I think the chimps are more important, or I think the bonobos are more important, because, you know, humans are basically chimp-like, or humans are basically bonobo-like. I think we got this sorted out now, uh, but there was a period after the bonobo discoveries came in when it seemed as though the science was going to sort of give way to, uh, you know, the kinds of multi-century debates that have been going on with humans. Are, are humans basically good or ba basically bad? Well, well, not only are they different in terms of their intra-group inter inter -group violence, but also within group violence, right? Um, they're well, radically yes. different. And, and I mean, a, a big difference is that females have a very much... Uh, more influential role in bonobos than they do in chimps. So in chimps, if you look at dominance, now, you know dominance means ability to win a fight. Well, in chimps, every male is dominant to every female. So every every healthy male, let's put it that way. Uh, and in fact, the way that a male enters the dominance hierarchy of males is to first of all beat up on every female and by the time he's done that then he's he's in the male group with the bonobos you have um the males and the females kind of weaving together in a dominance relationship in which some males are dominant to most females and some females are dominant to most or even all males. And then uh, you, you, it isn't that all male, females are dominant to all males or vice versa. It, they are all forming, as it were, a single hierarchy. But males in general are pretty scared of females. And the reason they're rather scared of them is because the females are better at forming aggressive coalitions than the males are. So if there's a squabble between a male and a female, you know, maybe they, they both reached for the same super attractive food at the same time, as it were, and, and uh, one of them squeaks and, uh, and the other, you know, maybe they get into a little fight, then you can pretty much guarantee what will happen, which is that no male will come to help the male, but all of the females within earshot will come shooting along in support of the female. And so suddenly you've got five or six females chasing one male and they can attack him. They can, if they corner him, they might pin him down and uh, he might get a finger bit, uh, knuckle bitten off or you know, they can actually get wounded. So it's a society in which the males have been trained, as it were, not to try and take liberties 
with the females. And so important is the dominance of the females that if you look at which males achieve dominance among the males, it is almost always a male who's got a living mother who is herself pretty dominant and because she helps him in his interactions against other males. And that help is really vital. And that's just not true at all, the chimps. It's, it's all on their own. So, so now suddenly you've got a, a society that is in some ways matriarchal uh, in bonobos uh, compared to the you know, very, as it were, patriarchal uh, society of the chimps. And so what are the key environmental differences that lead to these very different equilibria? Um, you know, it seems like they're in very similar environments, and, and yet um, these are pretty stable equilibria. Presumably there's, there's no um, mutation among females and chimpanzees that would allow them to, you know, conspire in the way that the bonobos do, and there's no kind of mutation of a male that would turn them into a successful alpha behaving chimp-like in a bonobo environment. And, and there doesn't appear to be any conquest of bonobos by, by chimps. So how, how, do we, how do we explain these, these radically different equilibria uh, continuing to exist side by side and, 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 and be mutation resistant? It's a lovely puzzle. And it's a lovely puzzle particularly because they live on either side of the river, the Congo River. And uh, the, the curve of the Congo River as it moves from east, the eastern highlands uh, of the border with Tanzania, uh, all the way to the Atlantic coast. That curve uh, goes uh, up and across the equator and then comes down again. And uh, in that bubble uh, between the left bank of the river and the equator is where bonobos live. Uh, they straddle the equator. And the net result of that is that chimpanzees live to the west, to the north, to the east and in some places even to the south of some bonobos. So they're all around them, but there's a river separating them. So the habitat, the floral habitat, you know, has got to be incredibly similar. And it's clear that it is. Um, well, here's, here's the, what you observe with the um, bonobos. You observe that a difference uh, in the society between them and chimps is that the bonobo subgroups tend to be composed of several females, always. They, females are very rarely to be found without other females there, providing exactly that kind of support that we've just been talking about uh, against males. Whereas the chimps, the females are, are often alone. Uh, they might be uh, alone literally uh, with their offspring, or they might be alone with a couple of males. Um, so, you know, a fair amount of time, they, they go off and forage on their own. And that seems to be because uh, the foraging is better for them if they can get away from other individuals who are competing with them. Okay, so there's something different about the environment that means that bonobo females can forage together pretty easily and the chimps can't. Well, the, the story that I like uh, is certainly not proven for certain, but it sure looks convincing to me, is that the big difference is that on the right bank, chimpanzees share their habitats in those forests with gorillas. And on the left bank, bonobos have no gorillas. And the reason this looks important is that bonobos basically eat a mixture of chimp foods and gorilla foods. And the gorilla foods are the type of food that allows gorillas to live in a stable group. They always go around together with half a dozen females or two or three or four, whatever it is, always together. And those gorilla foods being eaten by bonobos allow the bonobos to do that too. Now, how, why it ends up with that circumstance of gorillas being only on the right bank and not on the left um, is fun to think about. Uh, what we know is that bonobos and chimps have been separated for uh, something like uh, a million years or more. And they came across the river, uh, fairly high up the river, uh, towards the eastern end at a time when there was uh, a great drying of the climate. 
So the river just got shallow enough that chimps could walk across. Why didn't bonobos, why didn't gorillas get across? Or, or maybe they did and later went extinct. But anyway, for some reason, they're not there now. And, um, and so bonobos were able to evolve to eat gorilla foods and chimp foods. And these gorilla foods, by the way, what they are, are um, herbs of very productive, uh, luscious plants that grow like meadows on the forest floor. Uh, and um, where you get these in the, the equatorial zones, they provide tremendous food for the gorillas, tremendous food for the bonobos. Um, and, uh, and the chimps uh, don't have so many much available to them because the gorillas are all eating it. So when we think about you know, whether humans are violent or nonviolent, I think you make a very important distinction between uh, reactive and, and proactive uh, violence. Um, could, you, could you talk a bit about that um, and, and also talk a bit about um, the difference between wild and, and domesticated animals, right? We live in a world where I think it's something like 90% of the, the biomass, the, the mammal biomass is, is, uh, is domesticated if we include ourselves as among the domesticated species. Um, and wild animals are, are violent in, in many ways that domesticated animals are not. Why is it useful to think in terms of these, these different kinds of, of violence? Yeah, it, it, it's, to me, it's a super important distinction. Um, and let me just begin by saying that uh, I think it's very clear that it's an important distinction when thinking about humans. Uh, the kind of violence that many people are impressed by with humans is, is war, intergroup violence. And war involves a very different style of aggression from the kind of aggression that we encounter, if we do, in day-to-day -day interactions. You know, the classic murder in America uh, is two guys in a bar and they insult each other. It gets intense. They go out into the parking lot, have a fight, and one of them dies. That is reactive aggression. That is uh, two individuals uh, getting to the point where they just feel intensely angry, their emotions are aroused, and uh, they want to get rid of the threat. They react in all sorts of violent ways. Very different from what happens in war. In war, planners, maybe they are generals or people sitting in their desks in Washington pressing buttons, um, think about how to attack an enemy. And having made a plan, then they organized to go and, and implement it. And that is true even when you're talking about people living in small-scale society, hunters and gatherers or horticulturalists, uh, sitting around a campfire saying, what are, we, what are we gonna do about those guys? Let's go off and attack their camp. So it is not, it doesn't have the emotional uh, valence of reactive aggression like the two guys in the bar. Uh, this is done coolly. Now they, they might get pumped in order to go and get them worked up for it. But uh, they don't have to. It can be entirely uh, sort of rational, calm, deliberate uh, form of aggression. And that is called proactive aggression. So this distinction between reactive and proactive aggression is basically a distinction between within group aggression and between group aggression. I, I'm not saying you can't have one or the other crossing the boundaries, as it were, but, but that's the, the big distinction. Okay, now let's think about humans compared to other species. Proactive aggression uh, in terms of trying to kill members of neighboring groups is pretty rare in animals, but it happens. We discovered it in chimps in the 1970s, and now we know that uh, it happens in wolves. It happens uh, sometimes in lions. It happens in spotted hyenas. It happens in you know, a few animals that have come up with this, this trick, as it were, this adaptation. And it can be very important. I mean, wolves, something like 40% uh, of deaths tend to be uh, the result of proactive intergroup aggression. So, you know, it's not trivial. What about, so, but still, humans are, are definitely on the very high end of, of uh, the tendency to use proactive aggression to kill members of neighboring groups. What about reactive aggression? So this is interesting because 
the fact that we are always slightly alert as we go about our daily lives to the possibility that somebody might be mean to us, might blow up and get angry, whatever, um, might suggest that reactive aggression is also really uh, sort of relatively elevated in, in humans. But that doesn't seem to be true at all. Because if you look at the rate at which uh, fights break out within groups, we have lovely data for chimpanzees compared to humans. And with chimps, it's, you know, we don't have enough data on humans, really, but it's somewhere uh, between 500 and 1,000 times as frequent in chimps as it is in humans. And the human data come from groups that have relatively high rates of fighting. Right. So within humans, there's quite a bit of variability, right, between, say, um, uh, people in, in environments of of, uh, of strife and, and conflict versus environments that are relatively peaceful. Presumably in a, yeah, in yes, a prison, it's going to be different from in a, in a, in a corner office. Yeah, there's very peaceful societies, like a famously peaceful one in Thailand. And, you know, if you take people in a monastery, probably, you know, there's a bit less losing of tempers. Um but, it, but the important thing is it doesn't really matter, uh, this variation, for the purpose of making the claim that chimps are much more uh, reactively aggressive than humans because you're not going to find uh, anyone, any population that has anything like the frequency of daily fights that chimps do. Um, so so I want to make the, the, the claim here that humans are elevated for proactive aggression in relationship to other animals, but are down-regulated for reactive aggression compared to other animals. And I think we have a, a fascinating story now as to why and how this has happened. Oh, isn't the traditional story really one of group selection? Wouldn't that be the, uh, the you know, I think most people in, in the biology world would probably point to that as, as, as one explanation. That, that's quite common. What, what's, yeah, what's the problem with that? What's a number the, of people what's the problem with that? Exp that that uh, during the Pleistocene, uh, groups that were more united uh, had their members more united together, were better at winning contests against other groups, and so there would be selection in favour of the behaviour that led those groups to be united. Uh, in other words, a reduction in competition within the group. Um, and um, uh, I suppose, you know, more cooperative behavior uh, in the group. And the difficulty about that is that when people have tried to model this on a theoretical basis, when they started doing that, they assumed that the patterns of aggression in intergroup contexts in humans were unique to humans. Well, now it turns out that chimps have a very similar system and similar sorts of death rates, so far as we can get data from human uh, hunter-gatherers and so on. Uh, and, uh, and yet you don't see any kind of selection for that co cooperation and uh, reduced aggression within groups in chimps. Uh, another group of people would say, wait a minute, your theoretical models don't work anyway because there should be continuing selection for aggressiveness within the groups. In other words, the group selection models are fundamentally flawed. But, you know, even without that, I think the empirical comparison with chimps is very telling. The, the, I think the nice thing about um, the way in which uh, a number of people are now starting to think about the selection against reactive aggression in humans is that it's testable at a couple of levels. So in order to talk about this, we've got to talk about wild versus domesticated animals. And everybody loves uh, the experiments that were started by Dmitry Belyev in the 1950s in Siberia, which showed what happens when you select against reactive aggression. So these were experiments that involved a, uh, a sort of variation of the red fox. Uh, called the silver fox, slightly confusingly because actually it looks rather black, this fox. But um, these silver foxes uh, were uh, brought up in Russia in sort of mom-and-pop 
uh, fox fur farms as part of a, a fur industry. And they had been incredibly valuable. Uh, they lost their value um, after a bit, or oh, their, their huge value, uh, when the market was flooded. But still, there were lots and lots of people breeding these things. And um, so for 50 years, they had come across from Canada. They were being bred in Russia. And uh, at that point, they were still pretty wild. So there's a lot of snarling and a lot of um, difficult behavior with regard to human management. Belayev wanted to test some genetic ideas of his own. He became head of a genetic institute uh, and decided to see if he could select for the tamest of the foxes. So in 1958, he started an intense selection pressure and the intense selection meant that what he would do is he'd have his assistants uh, walk towards different fox cubs when they were something like six weeks old and write down the distance at which the cubs snarled at him, at the, the observer, and then was able to choose, sometimes among hundreds of individuals, the ones who had allowed the observer to come closest. So those were the tamest ones. And within 10 years, they had some very tame animals. Animals so tame that they behaved like dogs of uh, uh, coming towards people and uh, looking for ways to get affection from the people. And the other thing that happened was the dramatic thing. So in addition to selection against reactive aggression and therefore uh, evolving these psychological changes in the foxes that meant they were tame, you got all sorts of unselected changes happening as well. And these were the most dramatic and obvious was white patches appearing on the fur in greatly increased frequencies. And just as many dogs, many horses, many cats have got white socks, have got a white tip to the tail, have got a white patch on their forehead, so did the foxes that had been selected for tameness. And this turned out to be one of a number of features which we uh, think of as traits associated with domestication. Traits associated with, as Belayev specifically showed, selection against reactive aggression. So you reduce the reactive aggression and you get these domestication syndromes, up to 20 different traits popping up unselected for some fascinating biological reason that is still being studied. And this now, let's now shift to thinking about the domesticated animals that we, we know about that have been domesticated for thousands of generations. If we look in the archaeological record, uh, if we look at um, the time, say, five to 10,000 years ago, when many animals such as cows and sheep and, and uh, uh, cats and so on were being domesticated, archaeologists quite often want to know when they find some bones. Now, was this a wild out version or was this a domesticated version of the sheep or the horse or the dog? And there's some fairly simple rules for deciding which it was because domesticated animals show differences in their bones and teeth from wild animals. And here are the differences. Uh, they tend to be smaller with slenderer bones. They tend to have a shorter face and smaller teeth. There tends to be reduced differences between males and females. So male horns and male fighting apparatus is reduced and the brain gets smaller. So if you have a, a species that has all of those characteristics, you say, well, that's been domesticated. In other words, there's been selection against reactive aggression. OK, now cut to humans and go back in the fossil record. And you find that humans show all four of those features. The, the thing starts um, 300,000 years ago, the, this tendency. So 300,000 years ago, you have uh, the specimens from Morocco that have been recently re-examined by Jean-Jacques Hublin and his team. 
and uh, they start the process of looking like Homo sapiens. In fact, he calls them the very earliest Homo sapiens. And they don't have all of those features, uh, but they have the short face and, and smaller teeth. Uh, and they also have reduced um, uh, brow ridges, which is another feature that turns out to be associated uh, with uh, aggressiveness in humans. And fascinatingly, there is a, uh, a really interesting feature, which is the relative breadth of the face in humans, which we see changing during the latter Pleistocene from um, 200,000 years uh, onwards uh, to the present. Is that related to a reduction in testosterone? Uh, no. Um, there is, you, you can find some testosterone associations, but uh, it now turns out that you don't see simply uh, males getting broader faces when testosterone comes in in adolescence. It seems to be something deeper than that. And the reason that this is so interesting is that uh, there's a cottage industry that has emerged looking at the relationship between the breadth of a male face, or actually sometimes female, um, and aggressiveness. And it turns out that nowadays, men who happen to have relatively broad faces also tend to be more aggressive and to be perceived as more aggressive by naive individuals who know nothing about the kind of study you're asking them to participate in. It's not to say that all men with broad faces are aggressive, of course. You know, there's lots of variation. So this is not biological determinism of that <coughs> form. But it is to say that when we go back in time and see, as we do, our ancestors with increasingly broad faces as they go back, we can to be rather confident in reconstructing that they were increasingly aggressive, reactively aggressive as we go back. So you've got those kind of anatomical changes. You've also got genetic changes. And here I want to bring in a couple of other species, Neanderthals and Denisovans, species of Homo that occupied Europe and, and Asia that separated from the lineage leading to sapiens something like half a million years ago and that do not show any signs of uh, reduced reactive aggression. They don't show those four archaeological markers. They don't show the reduction in facial breadth. In fact, they've, they've got very broad faces. So they look like a good model for uh, a pre-sapiens ancestor. And we need a model because we don't have many bones from the immediate ancestors of sapiens. Well, the great thing about Neanderthals and Denisovans is that we got complete genomes from both species. So we can now ask the question, does the genetic change that we see in wild animals to domesticated animals that seems to be responsible for the reduction in reactive aggression, do those genetic changes also occur when we compare Neanderthals and Denisovans on the one hand and Homo sapiens on the other? And the answer is yes. The answer is that the data are still in the early stages, but uh, work particularly by uh, a group led by Cedric Box in, in Barcelona is getting very convincing about a whole series of genetic changes that have happened in sapiens that look just like the, domestic, the changes that you get in domestication from wild animals. So, you know, this is a very exciting area because this is going to be increasingly testable. And and uh, I think it's clear where you'd want to put your money right now. Now, we, we know who domesticated the cow. We know who domesticated the pig. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, it was us. Uh, so who, dom who domesticated us? Um, we, this, this is, is the obviously question a case of, of self-domestication, right? Yeah. You know, no, and, and you know, I've got to, I can't avoid the historical context of saying that Darwin considered that problem and said, there was no one to domesticate us, and so it couldn't happen. And you know, he'd he be interested the in, in the idea that we were domesticated, altruism. but he couldn't think of how it would have happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we now have a very convincing argument uh, that has been produced by Christopher Bowen by looking at uh, accounts of the lives of uh, people living in small-scale society nowadays where there is no 
police system, there is no prison system. Uh, the control of violence has to be done entirely by the resources of the people living in small camps, small villages. And, and the answer is that uh, the society comes together to face down a bully. Uh, a bully will be uh, ridiculed, cajoled, teased, shouted at, sung at, uh, ostracized, uh, you know, made to feel quite clear what the society thinks about him. But what Bohm showed is that there are many accounts in which the bullies thought they could get away with it because all of those social pressures mean nothing if you are a sufficiently immoral person who just doesn't care what other people think. You'll just carry on doing it. You'll just carry on taking advantage of uh, a woman when she's on her own and, uh, and, and raping her, even though she's got a husband somewhere. You, you, he might be out there killing men who he disagrees with. I mean, there are nasty stories about, about the behavior of men in societies where you don't have any police. I mean, this is the question that economists are always asking, right? Why, if you have a group of peaceful people, uh, then it, it seems to be uh, not mutation resistant, right? Someone who comes in who is uh, going to throw their weight around and be violent and, and defect from any cooperative arrangement is going to ultimately get ahead. And so the How do the economists answer that, that? What's that? How do the economists answer that question? Well, uh, that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's about reputation usually, right? It's, it's about, uh, if you don't have a mechanism of, of reputation, then you need to resort to something like a social contract that's enforceable. And, and economists have a difficult time really, um, explaining the kinds of social systems that we have in place. Well, that's how they've evolved. Yeah, no, and it is an interesting problem, but, but I think that, um, uh, the answer that Bohm came up with is right, which is that uh, when all of those social pressures fail, you have to resort to execution. And this was kind of a shock when people first started looking at the ethnographic record systematically, because uh, the, I mean, one of the first people who did it, Keith Otterbein, uh, he did it to prove that execution was going to be so rare that it was unimportant that it was restricted to state societies uh, because state societies, are, there's a monopoly on violence by the state and they use it in a way that is totally new. That was his argument. Well, lo and behold, it turns out that hunters and gatherers on every continent use execution. There are lots and lots and lots of descriptions of executions in small scale societies. So wouldn't, wouldn't castration have the same same effect? Wouldn't that work equally well to Domesticate? No. Castration? No, because yeah. it wouldn't st stop. I mean, you can castrate a man, but it, uh, if you castrate him uh, basically any time after puberty, uh, it doesn't change his behavior at all. And even R before right, but it puberty, would if, you're it if you're trying much. to breed, if you're trying to, if you were intentionally selectively breeding, right, a norm that, that castrated violent bullies would presumably lead to the same evolutionary path as as capital punishment, right? Oh, okay. So you're thinking about the evolutionary consequences. I, I was thinking about the, the social consequences, you know, that if you're just trying to stop someone from being violent, castration doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it, so it's true that, it, that, it, that the evolutionary consequences could be <coughs> somewhat similar if you castrate. I say somewhat because um, a man who remained alive uh, unable to to conceive any future children would still have a level of fitness that uh, would be you know, somewhat good for him, I guess, uh, because he could help look after his young. But if you kill a man, then uh, his young are likely to suffer as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you read accounts where a man is killed and all his kin are killed. Uh, so, you know, Killing clearly is is going to be more effective in the end, but the of course you know you're thinking analytically about the evolutionary consequences, but that's not the way that people are thinking in small scale society. They're thinking just how to get rid of this bastard, and uh, so 
they're not interested in castrating him. Uh, they, they want to get rid of him. Um, but you still have the collective action problem, right? Because why would I, as an individual, uh, have any incentive to, to punish the, the bully? Um, why not just let all my colleagues punish the bully and I'll just sort of sit out from the, from the punishment? Because that, well, that presumably think, punishing the bully is dangerous, right? The, it, the most dangerous thing that you can do in small-scale society is to be a nonconformist. So here, here's the way I think about it, that um, you've got up to, say, three or 400,000 years ago, uh, you have our ancestors living in small groups dominated by an alpha male uh, of a chimpanzee style or a baboon style or a macaque style in which uh, the the male has no moral feelings at all with regard to fairness or justice or anything like that. He's, he uh, acts with total uh, self-regard uh, with regard to uh, bullying others, uh, taking from others, um, uh, taking um, mating rights, and so on. And that alpha male continues merrily along his way until the time when language gets sufficiently sophisticated for the subordinate males to be able to make a plan. Now, this is the point at which the question you asked about do the male chimpanzees communicate with each other in planning to attack members of neighboring groups? This question now becomes salient when we ask it about do males communicate with each other when they're going to attack members of their own group? Because now you've got a different dynamic. Instead of everybody is an enemy, you have an awkward balance where some males might be allied to the alpha male, some males might be intimidated by the alpha male to the point they don't want to try and do anything about it. You have to talk to each other and generate an agreement both to carry out a killing, we're all in this together, right? And to make sure that um, subsequently uh, you will uh, forgive anybody who has been part of that killing. So this is getting a little bit subtle. But that's the idea, that they, they are able now for the first time in evolutionary history to share intentions because language is sufficiently good. And once they can do that, then uh, you can have somebody knowing that they will be supported by the rest of the uh, alliance, killing somebody on their own with an arrow in the back or whatever the mechanism is. Now, just as with the chimps attacking chimps in neighboring groups, the costs of, of aggression are going to be extremely low. But your question about, well, still, you know, why not leave it to everybody else to do it? Uh, I think the, the additional answer here is, if you don't show that you are part of this group, then you run the risk of b developing a reputation that says you're not part of the group. Uh, you are a threat. You are a witch. You might do magic things against the group. And so, in other words, once the originally subordinate males have come together in an alliance with each other to take down the alpha, then they have developed a social power that is terrifyingly effective because they can look at each of themselves and say, is Joe really with us? You know, I saw him, you know, doing something suspicious the other day and Joe can develop a reputation for being a little bit selfish, a little bit uh, dangerous. Let's get rid of Joe. And the males don't mind getting rid of, you know, several Joes because they have more for themselves. And you call this the tyranny balance. of the cousins, right? You call this tyranny of cousins. Yes, this is the tyranny of the cousins. And then, of course, you know, the scary thing about this is that that not only are they going to um, monitor and regulate each other, but they're going to do the same with the females. And, you know, so people uh, often ponder about why it is that uh, the law and politics and religion all tends to favor male interests. And surely the answer is that the very uh, origins 
of the institutional structures of these systems of coalition lie in the males uh, who were getting rid of any bullying male. The, the, the reason that you, you have these alliances, I think, goes right the way back to three or four hundred thousand years ago when the first males started realizing the social power that they could have by, by forming an alliance. Is, is the promotion of monogamy a, sort of a, a, an end stage of this development of the conspiracy of, of beta males to kind of level the, 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 tyr the tyrants? Well, um, you know, monogamy is a funny thing because we tend to think of us as a monogamous species, but actually, of course, in many ways, we are a polygamous species. Uh, you know, we are polygamous, meaning polygynous, many wives, uh, predominantly, because uh, you find that in uh, or eighty something percent of human societies, eighty-five percent, I think it is, um, you have a, a series of men who are married polygynously. Still, most men are married monogamously, because uh, because. Uh, even if most women are, are married uh, polygynously, uh, there's still going to be you know, a bunch of wives uh, left for the monogamously married men. So when when did this? Uh, I mean, well, when you say, what did what did these changes do to make us monogamous? Um, you have to start thinking about what life was like before then, and. The way I would think about it is that the alpha male had been very effective in getting what we would now think of as more than his fair share. Now, that still happens to some extent today, that alpha males can get great disproportion. Um, they're different alpha males, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> they don't use personal physical fighting to become top of the heap nowadays. But, uh, but successful males can be very, very polygynous today. But I would say that if you want to go back in time to 500,000 years ago and compare with 250,000 years ago, in other words, pre-moral versus the initial moral phase, I would certainly imagine that the distribution of, um, of uh, reproductive success had spread out so that instead of an alpha male taking a big proportion of it, then it was much more likely that all of the males in the alliance would have a wife, if you want to call it that at that point, um, and um, uh, therefore resentment by those males who didn't have wives would be reduced. Now, you know, this gets into quite a complicated territory, I think, because basically uh, the mating system interacts with the political system. So if you look at small scale societies today, what you find is that the elders, you know, people always talk about the elders. The elders are the ones who tend to sort of come together and make a decision, the council of elders. Well, the council of elders is to a large extent breeding males. The bachelors are not in the, in the council of elders. Sometimes you might find that the younger fathers are not either, but mostly by the time they're fathers, they, they're in the elders. So, you know, that is the alliance, I think, to a very large extent. So why do you suppose Darwin and others were so, or at least didn't even think of this idea of, of violence being disfavored and wanted to emphasize the, the idea that cooperation was, was favored? Is this, is this just a, a, a distasteful idea? I don't think Darwin was afraid of distasteful ideas. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not enough of a Darwin scholar to, to, to have has a really good answer to that question. But, um, you know, Darwin thought about domestication, couldn't think of a mechanism for it and, and abandoned it. But then when he was thinking about the evolution of morality, which in my mind is very closely aligned with the question about domestication, he did mention his observation that violent men tend to get executed or imprisoned nowadays, which is sort of functionally 
a temporary version of execution, as it were. Um, and, um, and I think that was in his mind. But again, he didn't really develop the idea. And, and you know, why exactly he didn't develop it, I'd be fascinated to, to find out. We also talk about Durkheim and the idea of reputation and how important it is. And, you know, I think it's, it's, been, it's somewhat of a mystery as to why people put so much emphasis on reputation. You know, people commit suicide based on, you know, the social media posts uh, that, that ridicule them, uh, which, which seems a, a bit extreme. Um, and yet, even at a very, very early age, people are concerned about reputation. Uh, the, the feeling of, of rejection is, is similar to the feeling of, of pain. It's, it's deeply felt in similar parts of the brain. Yes. Uh, I think this, this story that you're proposing suggests that if you're not concerned about your reputation, this, this could have fatal consequences. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, it's a startling thought. You have to swallow a little bit hard to think that execution happens sufficiently often that it had these kinds of powerful selective effects. But if you, if you just take that jump, and um, and say, okay, you know that that individuals who developed a bad reputation for whatever it is uh, were vulnerable not just to being jeered and and sneered at and teased and that sort of thing, but actually were vulnerable to being executed. Then it really does seem to explain a lot of the. Um, the patterns of human morality and and larger associated things. I mean, you know, people don't think of morality exactly as being as including this tendency that humans have to be more pro-social if they see two large blobs looking like eyes looking at them. But subconsciously, experiments show that people. You know, will give more to a charitable uh, request if there are somewhere in sight there are two large blobs looking at them. You know, we have these subconscious tendencies to care about uh, our reputation, and I think that the uh, the execution hypothesis basically solves that sort of problem. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know, people think that uh, it's unreasonable. I mean, they often worry that the rate of execution that is needed to sustain this uh, seems unreasonably high. But we know very little about rates of execution in the past. New Guinea is a you know the place in the world probably where people have lived with least contact with the um, industrial, uh, heavily agricultural world. And there are two studies there, uh, one by uh, Bruce Nauft and, um, and uh, one by Ray Kelly of different peoples uh, where they were able to go in fairly shortly after contact of these small-scale horticulturalists, uh, contact with uh, the government and mission stations. And then they, they sorted through uh, accounts of how people had died. And they found that, uh, I'm going to get the exact numbers wrong, but it's, uh, I think, 12% in one case and 20-something percent in another case of deaths had been executions. And presumably that so would be the, disproportionately male, right? So that would be a, a more than 12% of the males. Uh, yes, exactly. It was more males than females in, in both cases, which is the typical pattern. Um, and uh, so, you know, this, these were societies full of fear of sorcery and witchcraft uh, in which, as is repeatedly found in small-scale society, um, if there is a death, then somebody is blamed for it. You know, nowadays, if somebody dies from a disease, we blame the germs. But those people uh, routinely would blame another person. It's as if they're looking for any possible case that somebody is trying to interfere with the success of the group. They're so alert to the possibility of nonconformists undermining society. I so, you know, maybe those aren't explains... representative, but, but you, know, you know it can happen that uh, people will have 
high rates of of death from execution. Well, you say this also might explain some of the um, unusual features or um, paradoxes of, of morality, right? Like the preference for inaction over action and so forth. Yes. I, I mean, um, people who study uh, moral responses, responses to moral dilemmas, have come up with a series of generalizations. Um, and uh, those generalizations tend to fall or they they, they uh, align with the notion that moral responses tend to be self-protective. I think of it as uh, people are paying a tax to protect themselves from being regarded as a potential competitor. And the tax is, okay, let me be a little bit more pro-social than you think, or let me be a little more cooperative than you expect. But at the same time, the answers to these moral dilemmas that people tend to find is that individuals try to distance themselves from taking responsibility for anything. And so you know, that seems to fit with the notion that they're not quite certain how this is all going to pan out, but you don't want to be taking a risk where people might in the future saying it was all your fault. So, you know, in the, the classic trolleyology uh, studies uh, where people study what, how people would react if uh, there's a runaway trolley and you have the opportunity to divert the trolley because you happen to be standing next to a junction line with a junction box um, away from hitting one person uh, to hitting five. Uh, sorry, no, away from hitting five people to hitting one. Uh, should you do it? If what that means is you are taking action to kill that one person who's going to get hit by the trolley. Uh, well, people try and avoid taking responsibility in general. You know, so another example is uh, you're standing on a bridge overlooking where the trolley is coming, shooting under you, and there's a fat man on the bridge, and you could push the fat man from the bridge onto the trolley line and that would stop the trolley, but it would kill the man. And uh, and the reason that it might be worth doing this is because if the trolley goes shooting under the bridge and is not stopped by the fat man, it'll kill three people further down the bridge. Well, people do not like, you know, they hate being put in a position where they're going to take responsibility for killing someone, even if it would take, save three other people's lives. And the reason seems to be that people are nervous about exactly um, how others will respond. So I, I, I like the idea that our moral reactions have been primed to be conformist, always on the basis that we're scared that if we do the wrong thing, we are going to get severely punished. And punishment would normally mean your reputation is hit, and if it's hit sufficiently badly, you actually risk, risk execution. Now, one of the most puzzling things about domestication in this context is that uh, the brain, human brain got smaller. Um, part of the story of human evolution, including the part that's uh, described in this book, is, is a story of continual kind of brain growth. And then domestication comes in and, and that process is, is reversed. Um, why, why would uh, smaller brains... Uh, lead to lower reactive violence uh, and 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 better better human you know behavior. So here I can't cite studies that um, will give you a convincing answer, but what I am prepared to do is to hazard my own suggestion here, which some people hint at. Um, so, like many of the features of the domestication syndrome. Uh, it's not absolutely one-to-one. -one. Um, if you take something like uh, 22 species that have been looked at uh, of domesticated animals compared to wild animals, the average reduction in brain size is something like 14%. Um, and if you compare chimps with bonobos, you find that uh, bonobos have got smaller brains compared to chimps. But also, fascinatingly, you find that whereas male brains are bigger than female brains in chimps, they're basically the same size in bonobos. So that means that the loss of brain size has been associated with, a, um, with maleness. 
in bonobos. Okay, so um, in humans, we have uh, somewhat bigger brains in males than females. Uh, so if you take adolescents who are exactly the same size, uh, you find that uh, male brains are slightly larger than female, about 10%, something like that. The, the story that I like here is that when selection is acting against reactive aggression, it is um, acting in favor of juvenility. Because if you compare juveniles and adults, then adults are far more likely to get involved in a serious reactive fight. Juveniles, you know, they might sort of get into some play fighting, but if somebody threatens them seriously, then they're, they're going to run away. They're not going to stop and fight because they're not adapted for it. They're, they're too small and, and weak. This is going to be true in every species. But adults are the ones who are adapted for fighting. Now, if you remember to high school, you would remember that uh, different people went through puberty at different ages. Some are early developers and some are late developers. If you have selection acting against the propensity for reactive aggression, I think that selection would favor individuals who are late developers, whose uh, reactive aggression comes in late. Uh, now, of course, additionally, uh, you should have it um, coming in not only late, but relatively muted, relatively down-regulated. Well, let's just stick with it coming late for the moment. Um, then uh, those individuals who are more juvenile-like later and eventually into adulthood will be the ones that have reduced reactive aggression. So I think of the easiest target of uh, selective action when favoring individuals who have less reactive aggression is the rate at which emotional maturity arrives, the rate at which the emotions mature into the adult emotions, and eventually uh, maintaining juvenile emotions throughout life. And juveniles have smaller brains than adults. So inadvertently what you're doing is selecting for individuals with smaller brains. But doesn't and that mean that there's some some part of our cognition that's that's not as well developed as as would be if if the brain was allowed to uh, develop into a mature size. Yeah, I mean, it, um, it would seem as though you know everything we know about brains is that bigger brains are better for cognitive problems, right? And yet, people have done a bunch of studies, not huge numbers, but some quite systematic ones, like with guinea pigs and cavies, um, dogs and wolves comparing the cognitive abilities of domesticated version with their wild ancestors and the domestication, domesticated species have got these smaller brains and you don't find any systematic difference in hmm. puzzle solving. But it's it's you, making me I, wonder, you know, this is a bit informal now, but it makes me wonder if, you know, a significant reason for the increase of the size of the brain is to enable more effective reactive aggression. And if you don't need the reactive aggression, you can cut it back. See, it's it's interesting. It's like economists and behavioral economists, they tend to think of they, they think of it in a very simple way, right? You have the limbic system and then you have the prefrontal and parietal cortices. And the 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 limbic system is your system one that's responsible for the more uh, reactive, intuitive, and instinctual parts of your behavior. And I presumably that would include reactive aggression. And yep. then the you know the the outer portions of the brain are responsible for the the, the more mature decision making, and so one would think that the the way in which you would get rid of reactive aggression would be to have a bigger prefrontal cortex. But but maybe it's just that you have a a smaller limbic system. Is is that where the loss takes place? Smaller amygdalas. Well, I mean the, the limbic system is small enough that reductions in the size of the limbic system have very little impact on the reduction of the size of the whole brain. But nevertheless, what you say is true. Um, there's a, a German biologist, uh, uh, Dieter Kruska, uh, who has painstakingly looked at the limbic system in uh, half a dozen domesticated uh, species versus the wild ancestors. And yeah, that's where you get a majority, or it, that's where you get fairly systematic reduction uh, in 
uh, such as the amygdala. Uh, you know, there are people, uh, I mean, Brian Hare is, uh, is pushing the idea, and one or two other people uh, like this, the idea that uh, increased control of uh, reactive emotions uh, is important in domestication. And maybe that's true. Um, I don't think we've got any sort of real way to test clearly for that at the moment. Um, but it seems to me very unlikely that it's going to tell the whole story because, as you say, uh, we're, we're talking about fast and slow thinking, as it were, here. And there's lots and lots of reactive aggression that happens very quickly before you've got time to bring in the relatively slow acting prefrontal cortex, which is going to control the aggression. Well, I'd hate to let you go without talking about this book, because this, this book was uh, one of my favorite books. I've recommended this book to dozens of people. Well, thank you. It's my, great. My, my friends who enjoy, uh, you know, raw food diets. We, we actually have a restaurant here in Berkeley that sadly went out of business even before the pandemic, which served only uh, raw foods. Um, and so I think there's a lesson there the about why it went out of business. We had one in Boston <laughs> right. that went out of business. I mean, it's difficult to get people to, to like raw food. Right. And so, um, you know, you really highlight the absolutely transformational impact that fire had on, on humanity, not just in terms of our, our biology, but also in terms of um, uh, our society, division of labor, uh, social organization, and, and so forth. Um, you know, could you, I, I, we don't have time really, but I'd love for you to just uh, uh, summarize exactly, you know, how important was it for humans to discover fire? And, and why is it that this discovery and the timing of the discovery and the impact of the discovery uh, wasn't really recognized uh, until fairly recently. I mean, everyone knows that fire is, of course, extremely important. It's the most important discovery, you know, of, of humanity besides language. But the profound consequences that it had on on human biology and society, I think they probably were underappreciated, at least until this book came out. Yeah. No, I think that's right, that they've been underappreciated. And um well, I'll point to a couple of things. Uh, one is um, Claude Lévi-Strauss, the uh, the great social anthropologist from France who died uh, at the age of 101 about uh, 10 years ago, something like that. Um, he he had a book called The Raw and the Cooked, which he yep, wrote in the 60s. And uh, he drew attention to the fact that uh, humans make this huge separation between raw food and cooked food. And... He said that raw was nature and cooked was sort of humanity and it had full symbolic meaning. It was all uh, part of, uh, of a way of thinking that divided the world into, into two things, whatever part of the world you were looking at. Uh, so he drew attention to this, but he also said that this was totally arbitrary from the point of view of physiology. He said, because anything that we cook we can eat raw. So it's just humans wanting to separate themselves from nature. That's why we cook our food. Now, you know, you could say, well, okay, this was just some sort of slightly weird um, social anthropological concept and, and no one would take it seriously. But the thing that strikes me as so fascinating is that nobody challenged him. Nobody said, look, you know, cooked food really is important. And I think that that goes back to um, some evidence that uh, people had sort of filed in the back of their minds, as it were, which is that if you eat a raw potato uh, versus a cooked potato, uh, where all the food is packed into starch grains, and you then look at the output, in other words, you look at people's feces, and you see how many starch grains came through when you look at the raw potato versus the cooked potato. The answer is none in both cases. And that suggests that the raw potato is being digested just as much as the cooked potato. And when my colleagues and I produced the first paper on this topic in 1999, and it was the subject of, uh, of comments by published comments by uh, other readers uh, in the same issue, the 
one, one of the most prominent nutritional anthropologists, uh, Katie Milton, she produced that argument and said, I don't believe that cooking is more valuable or cooked food is more valuable than raw food uh, because look at this potato experiment. So nobody was taking the idea seriously that cooked food was actually better for you. Uh, and I thought that was, you know, kind of amazing because I knew perfectly well that if I tried to eat raw food, I ended up getting very hungry and it didn't take long to discover that this is true for everybody. Okay, so that's one kind of perspective. The other is this, that um, if you look at the archaeology of fire, then um, it does not go back to the beginning of humans. When I started getting into this in the 90s, uh, the consensus was that fire was first adopted about 250,000 years ago. Maybe you know, sporadic, maybe before then, but nothing serious. This is more or less when we came out of the trees. No, 250,000 years ago was... Or that we, no, we, we that began to after, sleep, on the, sleep on the ground what? and have fires to protect us from predators and, and so forth. Yeah, but, but look, look, here's my point, that, that um, when people saw the archaeology of fire beginning a quarter of a million years ago, that was one and a half million years after the right. genus Homo had become sufficiently like us that they could walk down Main Street and take clothes off the peg. You know, they looked like us. Right. They thought it happened much more recently. So, yeah. So, th so yeah. everyone was assuming that fire came in after humans had mm -hmm. achieved humanity in the sense of, mm -hmm. you know, being our shape and size. After Homo erectus, after Homo heidelbergensis, you know, then fire is acquired. So the challenge that I offered to people was to to say, look, that just doesn't make sense. Fire is so important in terms of reducing the amount of time we spend cooking, increasing the amount of energy we get from food, making our food uh, safe and not toxic or poisonous, uh, protecting us from predators, allowing us to sleep on the ground, all these different things. You cannot have it coming in a quarter of a million years ago and see nothing happening in evolutionary anatomy. And, and so then I started edging further and further back. When, when could it possibly have come in? And there's only one answer. And the answer has to be at the beginning of the genus Homo, the point at which our digestive system gets reduced, our mouths get smaller, our teeth get smaller, our guts get smaller, to judge from the flaring of the ribs and the, and the width of the pelvis. And, very important, the time at which we no longer were good at climbing trees. So obviously we had to sleep on the ground. Well, no one's going to go and sleep on the ground in uh, any of these areas in Africa unless you've got something to defend you, namely fire. So, you know, I'll put there's two things. First of all, people hadn't realized that cooked food and, and raw food have different implications in terms of their provision of energy. And secondly, they just thought that fire came in later, so it, it, it didn't do that much. So it's just that they were, they were relying on the archaeological record than the bi rather than the biological record. Yes, exactly. So, you know, I, to put it crudely, I think this is a case where biology beats archaeology. Mm -hmm. you know, and of course, so, you know, you will find lots of archaeologists who of course, dis disagree with that and say, you know, it's still not true. We can't, we can't find the evidence at uh, 1.9 million years ago and so on. But uh, the evidence is going back. It's, it's, it's pushing back and it's pushed back quite a lot since the publication of that uh, book 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And um, so, you know, I, I've, I have to assume that eventually the the evidence will get all the way. So if we, if we were to tie all three books together um, and we began the conversation by talking about how um, the differences between chimpanzees and uh, bonobos was, was driven by their, uh, their foraging methods and the availability of, of food and the environment um, is, is the invention of fire uh, the thing which created a, a, a vastly different way of feeding ourselves, which, which was the spark which led to the formation of uh, human social groups and, and social organization and led it to be so radically different from these other cousins of ours? Well, I think in very simple ways, and, and my simple ways are that fire was the thing that changed us from an Australopithecine into Homo. 
it, it changed us from being an ape into a very early kind of human. It gave us our anatomy, it gave us our digestive system, it gave us a way to um, spend so little time actually chewing, you know, changing from more than 50% to less than 10% of the day, so saving us many hours per day, that we could do other things with our time, spend more time making tools or exploring the environment, um, hunting, and so on. So fire made us homo. And then I think that, you know, we are homo sapiens, and I think that language made us sapiens, because language was what enabled us to share intentions in a way that enabled the males to form these alliances that came to totally shift the way in which society operated from probably a rather gorilla-like style, uh, a sort of combination of gorillas and chimps, as it were, uh, into uh, the style that we we can sort of abstract now from, from hunting, gathering life. So fire and language, to me, are the two things that made us homo and sapiens. And when you ask about you know, the, the groups and societies of, of pre-sapiens, I feel pretty reluctant to speculate because I don't think we got much evidence at all. You know, I said that I think they probably gorilla-like. I think we can say what they were not like. You know, it seems to me very unlikely that they had any kind of morality of fairness. I think they would be immoral, just like chimps are immoral, baboons are immoral, macaques are immoral. You know, they don't care about others in the way that we care about justice and fairness and um, the benefit uh, to uh, the poor and, and all that sort of thing. And that, to me, came in um, and and really changed society. But exactly what it changed it from is I, I can't think yet how how we're going to get at that. But no, yeah, I think one way it will be eventually to know more and more about Neanderthals because my bet my bet is that Neanderthals are a good social model for our ancestors. And look at them. You know, they had tiny groups, 10 or 15, um, very widely scattered, very rare interactions among each other probably, so rare that a lot of the breeding was inbred. That could well be you know, a strange model prior to our changing from a troop into a tribe uh, 300,000 years ago. Well, even if you're not a biologist, even if you're not an anthropologist, even if you're not an archaeologist, I think if you're interested in any issues related to humans, if you're interested in the nature versus nurture debate, if you're interested in the Rousseau versus Hobbes debate, regardless of where you are, if you're a humanist or a scientist, you have to read Richard Wrangham. So three amazing books, The Goodness Paradox, Catching Fire, Demonic Males, doesn't matter what order you read them in, fantastic, uh, I think, um, really wonderful books. I uh, really appreciate you, Richard, for, for joining me today. Thank you so much, Greg. Great questions. Really fun. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 